Hey. Hi, everyone. Waiting on one more person. Hi. 200 people. And here we are. Wonderful. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar series, How Do I Pitch This? COVID-19 and the Changing Landscape for Communication Specialists in the Arts, presented by Azura. That was a mouthful. Um, my name is Adam Merlick. I'm the manager of communications at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you all for being here. While we have a lot to cover with this group of experts, um, we will leave time for your questions. You could submit them via the Q&A option on your screen that you see there. To give a quick little background on this webinar series, I propose the concept for this panel because as someone working in the world of PR, when the news of the pandemic hit, much like everyone else, I was in touch with my industry colleagues and friends. Um, we were sort of informally connecting, creating a support and structure on how to deal with this and respond to this from a strategic point of view. Right off the bat, we were dealing with the unforeseen issues around what and how to communicate and pitch when it not only may seem tone deaf, but the contacts that we had worked with for many years um, may no longer be employed due to cost cutting measures. As receivers and sources for this content and information and kind of taking the temperature checks of the industry is primarily happening through communication contacts. So from visual arts to live performance and entertainment, publicists have become major drivers in creating a positive impact, uh, not only for institutions or clients, but for communities. Uh, I also felt it was important for everyone in the arts industry to be transparent and honest during this time, because we're all really going through this together in the end. So I've gathered together a group of professionals who uh, have volunteered their candid insights and expertise. Um, I have Molly Kraus, and she's the founder of her own communication strategy and advisory platform. Um, her firm, Kraus & Co., most recently, she stood as the interim communications director at probably the last art fair um, that everyone went to, the Armory Show. So welcome, Molly. Thank you so much for being here. As well, I have Hannah Gompertz, the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Dia Art Foundation, where she works across the institution's 11 sites, including everyone's favorite museum, Dia Beacon. We're so happy to have you here, Hannah. And last, but certainly not least, we have Marcella Zimmerman. She's Vice President at Cultural Council. Marcella has worked with so many different people, but most recently she helped launch the Artist Relief, which is an over $12 million emergency relief fund for artists across the United States, which I'm hoping she can um, share a little bit more about later. So I thought we might as well kind of jump into it, ladies, if that's all right with you. And I wanted to begin with a topic that I know is on the top of every seasoned publicist mind. And that is pitching. Pitching is something that we do every day. Um, as I mentioned before, we kind of are the sources and movers of information. And so I wanted to kind of start with the question that basically mirrors the title of this webinar is, is pitching tone deaf? You know, when, when news of this all first hit, everyone was kind of scrambling together. And it was kind of, Hannah specifically, I know, it was one of the things that we were talking about with our friends and colleagues of the PR world was, can we be pitching initiatives at this time? And so I'm curious to what you guys, your take was considering you have a broad range of different things to pitch. Yeah, I think from uh, my perspective, there were, you know, there are a lot of incredibly important stories to tell right now. And, you know, after that initial, you know, those first few weeks where I think we were all kind of in triage mode and getting used to this, this new reality, but, um, after that, a lot of people were really putting together incredible new initiatives. And in a way, that good news that was coming out of this crisis moment was kind of exciting. And I think there was a real appetite um, to, you know, find out more about these, um, the kind of creative things that were coming out of this moment as well. And I know, at, you know, at DIA, it gave us a moment to look back at what we had available for people already um, and that we could share through these new avenues. So we had this incredible bank of web projects that we had been commissioning for 25 years. Um, and, you know, really that it was a part of our website that had perhaps dropped off the radar for a lot of people. And we kind of 
had a moment we could refocus and put it back out there. And we saw this incredible uptick in visitorship, um, which was super exciting for us because it was part of our program that had really not got an awful lot of attention. And we had almost a 2000% uptick in visitorship on that part of our website. Um, and I think, you know, aside from that, there were also these really important institutional stories to tell. Um, and this was really a moment where pitching could become advocacy in a way. So, you know, we, wow. we were recently at Dear part of this New York Times story um, about the process of reopening, but also how museums are categorized. And we were categorized in phase four in a category that also included pop concerts. Um, and if we were kind of held, in, held to the same standards, that would be prohibitive for us to reopen. Um, and immediately after this Times story came out, highlighting that Cuomo's office responded maybe 30 minutes later, um, opening the door for museums to be recategorized into phase three, if they could meet certain criteria. I mean, now the, the date that we ourselves feel that it's safe to reopen may be very different to that. And it's a, a long path, but it's, you know, it's, a, it, it's great that we don't have to be miscategorized and held back because of bureaucracy. So stories like that, I think, of incredibly important to tell. At the yeah, moment. so on that note, Hannah, it seems like, especially with the New York Times article, it's kind of pitching, pitching it's, a, it, it's become a sort of force in power as opposed to pitching some sort of, um, some sort of angle. You're sort of pitching, you're, you're, you're pitching for a change now. And I know that that's something Molly as well, you uh, in the beginning of the crisis kind of worked with different institutions and what did you end up doing? You, you, you got this amazing story about all these institutions, actually the Morgan Library was included as well, um, donating the PPP gear, pre yeah, the so, active gear. Yeah, so as Hannah mentioned, pitching really become in this era a very action-oriented tool, more so than just getting a placement that made your client happy. It's been more of, you know, reaching Cuomo or, um, you know, enabling or providing an avenue for major institutions to donate their, you know, natural gloves that are otherwise just completely just sitting around. So as I mentioned, I contacted a number of um, institutions, Christie's, Morgan, Brick, um, Chime and Reed, um, Hauser, Swarn, so, uh, you know, all the kind of usual suspects, just institutions, uh, to do a combined press and kind of public service initiative where we could use the press as you know sort of a um a way to uh, set an example for small institutions so we were able to play, i was able to um, place a story that magnified the efforts of all these larger institutions so at this point i think that most galleries and institutions are totally tapped out of their ppe which was great so you know i think that that was a, a really wonderful way that we were able to use the press to the benefit of you know everyone during this crisis in particular. Definitely, and I feel like it becomes pitching stories are now a bit more organic and effective to telling stories. And as I understand, Marcella, I know Cultural Council has maybe picked up a couple of new clients amidst <laughs> all of this, which is such great news. Are you able to tell us a little bit about what kind of stories you've been pitching for these new clients? Because it's, it's not only Hannah and I at the museum obviously are pitching things that are within our institutions and our collections and such, as opposed to Marcella, you're pitching these brand new initiatives, which I think are totally tailored and exciting. Yeah, well, I think COVID has inspired uh, a bunch of really incredible and powerful collaborations and partnerships. You had mentioned the Artist Relief. So Cultural Council, we're the comms partner and the social media team for Artist Relief, which is an emergency relief fund for artists it started out as a coalition of seven grant makers, including our clients, Creative Capital and USA Artists, and they together raised $10 million at launch, which was immediately national news because generally in PR, we see the bigger the partnership, the more impact and the more news value there is. So already that was like a really successful campaign that was covered by NPR and Cranes and CNN. And then since then, you know, we've continued to help craft the narrative of this new initiative and we recently put out, uh, well, we didn't put out, the New York Times did a, a great feature centered around three recipients of, of the actual grants and also critical survey data from our uh, survey with Americans for the Arts, which uh, revealed like really sobering uh, statistics. 
53% of artists have no saving, 64% have become fully unemployed, and 81% have no plans to recover. So, you know, it's really changed the way we, we think about pitching and crafting a new story all the way to telling the impact and really the longevity of why these campaigns are so urgent. Definitely. And do you guys think that I know that in the past, I've worked at agencies, I've worked at multiple agencies. I think that everyone on this panel has been at agencies. Marcella obviously is vice president of one of the leading agencies. But I know in the past, especially, we as publicists will do this sort of batch pitching. Um, pitching, obviously it's our job to research and tailor certain lists and certain contacts that will be interested. But do you guys feel that now pitching is a bit more personal aspects to it? Yeah, so now whenever I'm, at, you know, composing a press release, I'll have like a separate, I'll have a simultaneous document open that's like pitch drafts um, because things now are so fueled by pitching and personalized notes. I haven't since started done a single blast. Everything I'm doing is, you know, really direct custom outreach to um, journalists. And I'm also um, uh, pitching a lot of freelancers because a lot of them in particular, you know, need work right now. So I'm being really conscious of, of as well. And to that point as well, um, when you, you say this really great, this great process on how you're writing a press release, but also have sort of a pitch document as well. Marcel, we were chatting the other day and we were kind of talking about press releases. And there was something you said about press releases that I totally agree with because it's press releases are obviously such an important part <laughs> of our day to day, but they do sort of live as these solid PDFs that are otherworldly not interchangeable in a sense. So what do you guys see the future of the press release being considering we, we, we turn on the news, we watch CNN, we have Governor Cuomo up there and every day is a new day. We never know what's going on. So I'm wondering what the future of the press release is considering it's this stagnant thing. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I feel like the press release that's really on its way out and has been for a long time. Publicists know that blasting out a press release doesn't get press. It's pitches that are tailored and targeted and it's pitches that show that your person acknowledged the situation and also ask questions to the journalists that can reflect their humanity so they really understand you're not just another random email blast. You're a real human with an ask and a question and a story. I think um, more and more press releases is just really a secondary tool. It, it says like the who, what, how, why kind of stuff, but not like the full story. It's just a, you know, a thing you just follow up with. And so Hannah, on that note, thank you, Marcel. But on that note, Hannah, how did your story with the New York Times come about? It obviously started within the institution. Was it something that internally you guys were discussing and that you wanted to take action on? Um, so we were actually approached by the Times um, for a story that they were thinking about that was more you know, really about the nitty gritty of reopening. So what kind of measures we were thinking about putting into place. So, you know, that's an important story to tell and we're kind of at the beginning of thinking through that process because it's it's, it's wildly complex um but something that we felt was really important to add to that story was talking about the advocacy work that we were doing internally um so in a way it was kind of taking a story that was already planned and inserting some of these other things that we were doing into it Amazing. And so I think we can all agree that the shape of pitching has definitely changed. It's almost these sort of love letters that you're sending out to people trying to kind of attract the attention and garner the attention that you're hopeful for. Uh, since we all agree on that, do we think that this will last? I mean, I'm optimistic and hopeful that the COVID-19 era will obviously end at some point. And so once we get back to the pre- I don't know, we'll, we'll never get back to pre-COVID because there will never be no pre-COVID, but once we get back to some sort of normal normalcy, do you guys think that it will shape this way for pitching for the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I mean, as Marcella mentioned, um, I think at kind of the high end of communications, it's been about personalized pitches more so than a release for a while, but I think that um, it will definitely be a lasting impact of the more personalized uh, kind of industry-wide. So yeah, only hope kind of a, a better way to do it and to form relationships and to be more organic and less sterile. So, yeah, and just last week we saw over 350 media jobs eliminated, just vanished. 
so many more were also furloughed. I think now more than ever, we're not only going to be pitching news items and ideas for profiles, but also stepping up to come up with bigger feature ideas and trend stories and not always just being a source for one idea, but a source for larger, broader concepts that can touch not just your clients, but the industry at large. Yeah, there's a lot more, I think, kind of cooperation. I mean, in, a, in the simplest terms, sort of helping each other out. There's not as much, it's not a really, oh, who's going to get one slot in the museum? And it's more like, how can we do a larger story about this initiative that ties to how we're all working together? It's a lot more collaborative. And I hope that that lasts. I think it will. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what both of you said is so um, important, actually, it's this like real sense of collaboration in so many areas in communications, but I think in, in all aspects of, of DIA, certainly we, we're speaking with our colleagues at other museums every day, almost, um, and pooling resources and pooling ideas, and that I think is reflected in a lot of stories that are being told now as well, so that's something that I certainly hope continues because that kind of transparency and sharing of information um, has been very refreshing um, and useful. It's, a, it's an amazing tool. Um, and to the Marcelo, you were saying, you know, hundreds of jobs lost last week in, in media. And I think we especially are seeing that in the sort of cultural parts of media as well. Um, so that pool of journalists that you would even approach for stories is shrinking almost daily, it seems. And the press release begins to seem, you know, even less of a useful tool when you you know that there are, you know, your 20 key people that you're going to be approaching. Of course, you wouldn't just send a press release. It's, you know, you would call them or send them a text or send them an email. And that's really how a lot of these stories are now going to be happening. Definitely. And so I, I think it all goes back to the fact that we're all in this together. And I think that it's a, we're, we're making a positive out of a, what could be a negative. And so, Moving along, since pitching, I know we could talk about honestly forever, um, but I'd like to not to, because it's really just one part of a publicist's job. And there's a lot more that goes into it day to day. I wanted to ask you guys, have you come across, what surprises have you encountered? What surprises have you come across? And have you been able to pivot with them in an unexpected way when it comes to your business strategy, consulting, anything really? Um. I've found that, I mean, not commuting and not going out, you, you surprisingly have way more time on your hands than, than I thought I ever would. Um, so I started an initiative, uh, sort of a more accessible price for artists and, and emerging arts organizations where you can pay $250 for a concentrated hour of a strategic case that you know, everyone watching this is quite capable of doing. Um, and I urge you to kind of consider doing initiatives like that because artists and people are, are really in need of kind of guidance right now. And they have, they're kind of, everyone's sort of sitting here like twiddling our thumbs waiting for this to be over. Um, but, and I think that now is a perfect time to be able to help artists to kind of realign their strategy before they're able to, you know, kind of launch back into post COVID. So if anyone watching this has the capability of sort of doing a more, not totally pro bono, but the pretty, as you guys know, with rates is pretty generous um, and has the capability to do that, I highly recommend um, making clear, you know, that you're offering that service to, you know, emerging arts organizations and artists. Definitely. And that's just such an interesting, um, you, you clearly saw that there was something missing and it's definitely missing right now. And now you're kind of able to, it's, to give that back to people that maybe not could have used your service beforehand. And now they can kind of look to you for some guidance and expertise during these times, which is really wonderful. Yeah. I mean, in terms of surprises, I've seen a lot of my clients just step out of their typical boundaries and think really outside of the box, which has been inspiring and really fun to help craft these new narratives. For example, the new Art Dealers Alliance, NADA, which has always been an association for, you know, emerging artists and dealers. They've really stepped up and have gone to advocate more for like small businesses. Mm -hmm. They launched a change.org petition demanding um, attention and support from the city for small businesses that got over 40,000 signatures. You know, you wouldn't think that NADA is an advocacy group for an, like a creative economy, but they really stepped up and were so much more than just, you know, an association for art dealers, you know? They really represented their broader community and I love seeing that. 
Um, the same goes for Kickstarter. You know, their mission is always to bring creative projects to life. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, because of COVID, they're breaking their own rules and allowing small businesses and nonprofits to raise money to just cover rent and basic essentials, which they had never done before, which is incredible. Yeah, that's really great. And I think that sort of brings me to the question, Marcella, especially um, considering that your clients are going through this with you. What practices have strengthened your relationships with possibly uncertain clients? I mean, you know, these are obviously dire economical times and to some um, institutions and some organizations, some clients may not feel that PR is on the top of their list and they're obviously cutting budgets. And so have you, have you figured out any practices to help strengthen your trust with your clients and just keep your clients' expectations at bay and keep them comfortable at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. I think just demonstrating an understanding of digital communications, that PR is just one piece of the puzzle. And we have to be thinking about amplifying our headlines beyond just the article going up on Business Insider or Artnet. How are we sharing those headlines with our direct marketing database on social media? Are we identifying the pull quotes for easy captioning so our clients can post on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter? Because that increases the reach of an article by thousands of impressions. Just, you know, showing little things that connect, you know, PR to marketing to their audience growth and also creating templates has been really um, helpful. For example, in our reports where we send, you know, the monthly roundup of links, we've added a little column that marks, you know, here's an awesome pull quote that you can use in a future sponsorship deck or use as a quote tile on Instagram, things like that. Definitely, that's, that's super helpful. And so we touched a bit about the fact that editors and such. I know most recently Condé Nast had a large cutback, unfortunately. Um, considering these major cutbacks and what kind of responses are you getting from editors and writers right now? I think that's something that would be super helpful because I'm sure a lot of people watching are thinking the same thing, like we touched about earlier. What, what is the temperature out there? What are the waters like out there? So can you guys give a little bit of feedback on what kind of responses you're getting from people when you're pitching in these kind of stories. I mean, these stories are so brilliant and they're really overarching. Are the editors responsive? Are you getting those kind of emails where it's like this, this email does not work here any longer and such? Or what, what is the temperature check then for that? I'm really conscious, unfortunately, do that I always will, before pitching someone who I haven't, you know, I'm not close with, I'll check their Instagram and just make sure that they're still at the publication. I mean, it's really kind of sad that we're in a phase where that needs to be done. But, um, and as I mentioned, I'm trying to pitch a lot of freelancers and I'm finding that, you know, freelancers will be depleted often. I'll ask editors, you know, the kind of date of that so I can recommend a freelancer. So um, I think it's just mainly being conscious of who has a job right now um, and being sensitive to that. Yeah. Uh, and also I think reaching out, not even necessarily with a story in mind as a first point of call, sort of reaching out as a check-in and seeing what kind of stories they're interested in looking for as well has been a successful tool for me. And I know a lot of my friends who, who are working in, in the industry. Yeah, it's really just been targeted outreach, making sure they still work at the publication. But also like you're saying, Hannah, just reaching out and saying, hey, like, let's catch up. What are you watching on Netflix? What are you reading? When's the last time you went for a walk? How crazy was that line at Trader Joe's? Just, you know, <laughs> making sure that they understand that you care about them, that you're also experiencing the same things. Yeah, that's um, sort of... I've, what's been um, like a nice tool for me and some, some of my other friends who work in this industry is we've done some kind of Zoom socials with people as well. So not talking really about work at all, but just inviting some of our journalist friends, you know, to join us for a drink, recreating oh, the, <laughs> the meeting. Right? It's like a, um, it's a media appointment, but it's digital now, you right. know, exactly. and you, you've got to be your own cocktail maker this time. You know, you can't, you can't go to a bar and depend on them. Um, that's really interesting. And so, I feel like it's really come down to the fact that being a communication specialist and a publicist, you know, I think that 
in every industry it's changing right now. You know, we're not just worried about what stories we're gonna place or what story we're going to tell. We're worried about shaping the image and shaping the reaction and strategy to these kind of things. And so have you guys found that challenging at all? Just, you know, you don't wanna be tone deaf in your responses. You want to be able to think of every single respectable response. And so how are you guys managing are you watching the news? Where are you guys reading? How are you guys keeping up to date so that you know what you're pushing out there is still relevant, if that makes sense? Um, I think definitely keeping up on uh, already subscribe to all the main art trades daily news. Um, it's required reading at this point, but breeze through those every morning or whenever they come in is important and it takes like two minutes total between them. So, so. Yeah, I'm reading the art trades, but also I'm obsessively reading like Time Out and AM New York, USA Today, Newsweek, Time. Marcel, it's time in now. Did you see that? What? It changed. Now it's time in. Did you cross oh, yeah. that? Time it? in now. Very yeah. Yeah. I love, yeah. honestly, I do love that. Good. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's reading as voraciously as usual, as all publicists should and do, but also just tapping into more mainstream news outlets as well to see, you know, can I be of help to a national features writer at Newsweek? Maybe, maybe they're looking for an uplifting culture story to help counterbalance all the negative news. Right, and so I, what, something that I personally have found a little bit surprising, especially working at the Morgan Library and Museum, you know, people may think that it's, it's over 100 years old, so people may not understand, but we have so much stuff online. We've been working on our website for years and years and years. And so I personally have been able to pull stories and pull different interesting things from museum goers that maybe would not have, I mean, obviously they can't come in. So we're, we're basically pulling things. And so Hannah specifically and Molly and Marcel as well, working with your clients, have you guys been able to pull from web, pull from archives, you know, create a new story out of something that maybe was already there? Hannah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think I had mentioned our artist web project series before, and we've sort of we've placed that in a few different places and kind of refocused attention on that. Um, and again, ditto for our, our archive of public program recordings. We had over 20 years of public programs, um, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Very few places have that kind of archive available for free. But I think I mean, we also wanted to think about new and different things that we could do to I mean, help promote those things, but also pivot and do something slightly different. And many of those things are also a way to continue to engage with artists. That was, this was really important for us, A, because we want to continue, you know, offering honorariums and helping our artist friends. Um, but it's also, it's, it's, it feels organic for us to do things like a blog, for example, where we could create new content around this archival content and po point people towards it. Because a lot of it existed on our website, but without any context. So it actually becomes quite inaccessible for most people. Um, so we've been working with a, a, a lot of people to kind of create little introductions for all of those recordings um, to help people kind of find a way in. Um, we'll, we've also been uh, using a lot of the materials that our educators have been putting together. We work with um, incredible artist educators who usually are going into schools and talking to kids directly, but they've been putting together these beautiful artist prompts that are kind of like mindfulness prompts. And a blog was somewhere where we could share these publicly as well, because mm -hmm. historically there hasn't been a section on our website for things like this. And yeah. it felt like something we really wanted to share more broadly. Um, and we also just launched an artist playlist series. Um, so we just, just before we closed down, had opened it. It's amazing, it. by the way, on Spotify, if you guys uh, have it already. It's, it's pretty great. I've been listening to them a lot. Um, but we just opened a Carl Craig exhibition, a sound installation on the lower level. Um, so Carl put together the first playlist for us and then Sam Falls put together one for us last week and we'll be launching another one today. And that's something that will continue on a weekly basis and then I think will become a kind of slower cadence. But, um, you know, I think in general, all of these things, it was really important to us that they felt organic, but also that they were sustainable beyond this period of time. Absolutely. So nothing that we're starting now will 
finished when we reopen the museum, it will all be extended and we feel confident that we have the sort of internal capacity to do that. Um, you know, and the same goes for the public programs that we've shifted onto online platforms, um, which was a completely new thing for us. And we did a, our first talk last week with Donna DeSalvo and Jasmine Raymond on Donald Judd. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was amazing to see 400 people there and it's, they stay for the duration. There was no drop off um, and tuning in from all around the world. And I think that's something that we've all been thinking about a lot, how this has become more international. Um, mm -hmm. The things that we're producing now can really reach a lot more people. So that's, it's been, I think these will now just become like a, a separate arm of what we do. Um, and it won't, it won't finish. And Hannah, yeah. if you don't mind dropping that Spotify link in the, in the I will, yes. leave some requests for that. <laughs> I think that the contextualization of that has been a huge thing during this time that we, we have the technology, you know, as they say, and, and if we have all this information, I have, um, uh, sort of extracurricular involvement on the um, executive committee of the Whitney Dam Prairies and the co-chair of Star Insurance Group. Both of the organizations had all this heavy documentation and were able to repurpose it um, during this time. And I think that Mad Museum has done a great job with that too. We've been offering weekly um, artist seminars. Um, and to that, everyone hates with a sort of um, a, a nonprofit, a museum. I found that now is like a real to reach kind of your reach people in terms of involvement, like maybe someone who's in your permanent collection or that you, because everyone kind of has more time now and it's not as hard as file names to be involved in your program. So I found that that's all a good, a good way to kind of make lemons, right? Make them yeah, right now. Right. Yeah, I love this trend of public programming becoming digital programming. And Hannah makes a great point about it becoming so much more accessible and more global. Another trend I've really enjoyed is seeing museums and galleries not only putting forth educational or archival content that's been curated to peak interest, but also this move towards digital wellness and self-care through the arts as well. For example, each week, Artist Relief produces and publishes a new, like, two to 15 minute wellness video by a different artist. And they're meant to be, yeah, like they're like meditations from artists from across the country or wellness practitioners or philosophers, scientists, poets, you know, really different looks at the way you can take care of your creative self. But I, I just love this trend. I'm seeing a lot of museums and galleries doing this too. So you're not always just like, you know, eating your vegetables, you're also, you know, having a, a cup of matcha or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I just saw a story recently that a friend of mine did, and I think it was like an artist skincare routine. And I was like, if that's not genius, I don't know what else is. You're yeah. like, that's, who doesn't want to see like their favorite artist skincare routine? You have to find the right artist to do it, but you know. Yeah. And but so it's not, sorry, Hannah. Yeah, I, I love what you were saying, Masada, about these like wellness, almost like wellness things that are coming out of a lot of our organizations. And I think, that's something that we've been thinking a lot about is how can we create digital content that t actually turns people away from the screens and think about their bodies like in space at the moment while we're feeling so disconnected. Um, and I think that a lot of, a lot of this digital programming that's coming out and artist created content is, is perfect for that, that use. Totally. And so to that point, you guys all gave me so much great information with that question. Um, you know, I want to kind of, I, uh, to everyone, please submit your questions. Uh, we will get to those very shortly. But before we do that, I have one last little note to um, express. Hannah, it's, it, it is super interesting. We're doing the same kind of thing at the museum, at the, at the Morgan Library Museum. Sort of, we have this blog, and you know, my position even as a communications manager has shifted in this sense that, of course, I'm doing my regular day to day, but at the same time, we are vamping up our blog as well. And we do two new original posts um, a week. And so now it's so interesting. I'm sort of acting as an editor now, which is so insane because I usually am the one on the other end of the spectrum. And I'm getting to work with these curators that have been with the museum for over 50 years on these really, really stellar things. So on that note, um, now that this, this period of time and the role of the communication specialist has shifted and changed, 
do you guys think that this change will remain permanent? I know that it was a question that someone had sent as well, and it was a question I had of myself. Do you guys think that this is long lasting? I, I think the things that you're talking about, absolutely. Um, certainly at our organization, I think, you know, my role, my department's role has suddenly shifted more into like a content creation um, arm of the museum. Um, and I don't think that that's going anywhere. I think there's like a, a real appreciation now for the importance of that. Um, whereas we, we didn't really have a focus on creating sort of readily accessible digital content beforehand. I, I mean, some of it was already there and we found ways to highlight it, but I think we've really shifted into more original content production. Um, so that's, and I think that's here to stay. Marcella? Yeah, I agree. I think this is gonna be an all digital communication strategy moving forward. I think, you know, the art world is really slow on the uptake when it came to like virtual reality, digital media, you know, some people valuing a small mention in print versus like a 3000 online story in a more indie publication. But I think what we're seeing now that there is so much value in digital metrics and being able to analyze data, target similar demographics and really spread your word through an organic audience that you build and leverage over time. I don't think that's going away. And I think if anything, this is one of the silver linings of COVID is that we're all learning to harness the power of digital communications for the first time as an industry. Definitely. And Molly, would you like to add to that? No, I agree. I think that in general, in COVID, a lot of practices in communications and beyond are going to be listening. I mean, the webinar has been around for, I don't know, like a decade or something, you know, in, in a popular way, but I had no thing tried it one, maybe one or two, but I've gone to like a thousand of them in the past two months, you know, and I think that what it feels like. yeah, and accessibility, and I think that there will be a lot of uh, lasting in a good way that will fit society in terms of accessibility. Um, it's just a, in, in like this, and I can't even think of you know, communications and all this. Definitely. Well, thank you guys. And so with that, I wanted to um, kind of transition to the question and answer portion of this webinar. All of these questions are being sent to me directly from viewers. So I'd like to begin with one quickly. I have a question from Jennifer. She writes, I work as an artist representative securing exhibitions for artists in museums and nonprofits. We have since expanded into digital marketing for artists. What is the best way to get the message about out about their work for upcoming virtual exhibitions to be amplified by art publications and their social media if the press release is no longer effective? I think that the press release, it's not to be, it's it definitely an important differentiation that the press release is still sort of an essential document and at, on kind of a basic level, not in the post press release era, but I think that pitching is it's just to clarify if that is just important we'll augment that and in some cases then a more kind of sophisticated strategy can replace it but definitely don't want to be confused that you don't need to write a press release at all for your institution or client um, but I think that in terms of getting attention from art trades digital otherwise fortunately there's been a lot of um, kind of transitioning from these like you know New York will do versions of exhibitions like Smith will, you know, in that type of thing. So fortunately, um, you know, the, the large players in the art media industry are adapting so that we don't have to do anything, you know, super special in that way, which I think is really great of them. And do you guys find it challenging to push these sort of digital exhibitions? Because it was already when I was working at an agency and you're looking over multiple different galleries, whether they be in Chelsea, the Lower East Side or Los Angeles, it was already kind of tough enough to get the recognition, the recognition that you would like for these artists that you truly love and these um, gallerists that you love. Have you found it to be super challenging to get sort of coverage for online exhibitions? It's not been super easy, but on the flip side, a lot of editors have changed their, their remit to include digital exhibition roundups. I mean, even the New York Times now is including a little capsule review of like two or three shows each week. So, you know, we're not pitching into a black hole. There's definitely an appetite for it on the other side, uh, on the editor side of things. But I think the way I'm thinking about it is not so much on relying 
on traditional coverage of exhibitions, but thinking about promoting these online shows the way you might promote a movie, you know, like what's your movie poster? If that's your Instagram tile that you get everyone to share, um, you know, is there some sort of trailer content asset that you can create that maybe uh, a less endemic art trade, a more culture focused website might want to run and thinking about, you know, different visual content pieces you can extract from the general exhibition concept to help give you some more targets other than, you know, listings and roundups and reviews. Yeah. And so with that, I have another question from a viewer. This one is from Thomas Brown and he asks, do we have any advice for smaller PR, do you have any PR advice for smaller organizations without existing large followings? Do we have any um, advice for smaller? You guys go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, in terms, if it's like in terms of the client or the organization you're promoting, you mean in the community term, but in terms of promoting, I'll just sort of run with how I perceive it. In terms of promoting an organization that has a large following or artists who might be emerging or unknown, it now is a great time to be kind of promoting them and putting them on someone's radar because it's definitely fresh and interesting. And it's sort of like any post now in terms of content that's coming across um and it, the media's desk um so i think it's definitely you don't feel you don't need to be like the line you know good you know version of that it can be there's less of like a template like needs to be high profile i think mm -hmm. in the media and i think the writers are looking for more unique stories so it's fine to be a small institution i hope i answered that correctly with what definitely. you're asking I would, um, one thing I would add to that as well is I think now is a great time to think about new partnerships. Um, and I think people are really excited about collaborating and content sharing. So, you know, we're, uh, we're sort of trying to do as much as we can with smaller organizations at DEA. So working with places like EAI, who we've had a long relationship with and our partner um, institutions in Utah as well. Um, and these places, you know, we hope it's, it's helpful for them to partner with us. It's also incredibly helpful for us because they have amazing content that we would love to amplify. Yeah, I agree. Partnerships are a great way to create new content, tap into someone else's existing audience. It just does the heavy lifting for you. And now is a great time to start building a bigger social media following. So I wouldn't worry about not having that base. I think everyone's at home right now looking at their phones, looking for something new to read and look at or follow. So you know, start now and just remember that content is king. The more you post, the more engagement you'll have, the more followers, followers you'll get. That's really the number one rule. Yeah, that's definitely a good takeaway is that content is king. You have, you kind of have to be pushing out original things for people obviously to want to pay attention to. So with that, we are still getting a lot of questions about pitching and I have one more question from Summer and she's wondering tips for, for making your pitch different. Is there an oversaturation with a lot of similar stories? For example, artist fundraisers. Do you guys have any tips to make sure your pitch is seen as opposed to someone else's that might have a sort of similar storyline going on in it? Inject lines are always super important to, you know, kind of, instead of saying, you know, um, online viewing room or, you know, virtual exhibition, and just cut that out of the subject line and just say like, you know, um, your artist from Kansas creates da, da, da. just like a cut of like what's not or unique or, you know, what's the back end of the story um, in the subject line, I think will always help. That's really helpful. Would you guys have anything to add? I think just the same answer to a different question, but if you're promoting a fundraiser, if you can create like gifts or stickers or little things that just make it stand out in the inbox a little bit so the editor can imagine how it would look online. They're going to want a colorful slideshow people can click through. That's, that's more helpful than speaking to like the background of each artist or the individual works. That's super helpful, Marcella. I would agree with that. I think imagery is really key. I always try and throw a ton of images in there. Um, so again, they can kind of visualize how it might look as a piece online because that's, you know, in some ways equal, as important as the content. Um, 
So yeah, I would say that's important and just keeping it really short and short and sweet. You can yeah. always attach more information, but I think keeping it snappy and throwing in some visuals. Is if, they're, exactly. if they're interested, you can send them more information always, you know? And so with that, we are running out of time, but I want to get in one last Q&A from one of our viewers, because I think this one is a nice one to sort of close out on, and it's a little optimistic. And so an anonymous question comes through, and they are asking... Mm -hmm. Any advice for getting a job in the communications industry? What can one do during this time to prepare for a career in the field? People should practice their writing, their journalism, you know, write an article from Medium or, you know, pitch a more indie blog about something you care about, whether it's a film or an exhibition you've seen online. I think like taking the time to write from the perspective of a journalist is the most helpful thing you can do to be a great publicist. Definitely, Marcella. I think that's great advice, Marcella. And when I'm hiring, I actually often look to people's writing skills. That's like really sometimes first and foremost. And if they have a writing background, that's a really strong start. And I also think now is not a bit, it's not diluting brand to with like, you know, a more emerging um, body. So I think that now is a really great time to work type of you know, maybe it's a budget or something like that I think that it's it's you know it's good practice to be working with client and client really right now so definitely um keep it open to working you know someone who approaches you it's good to kind of keep your mind sharp absolutely that's that's a great point Molly and so with that you guys I want to thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your expertise I feel like the theme of all of this really just shows that we're all remaining optimistic. We may all be in different cities and our different homes and such right now, but I think that we're optimistic, the fact that we're, we're keeping it going. You know, I think that we need to all be strong voices to keep the optimism up and realize that just because one art fair is canceled this season, it won't mean it won't come back next season and it maybe it'll come back in a different way just like it is. So I think that our optimism and remaining positive during these times is totally key. And so thank you guys so much. Up next today at 2 p.m., there is another Observer webinar on the current state of the art market. Uh, it's not too late to register. So head over to businessofart.observer.com. And I hope to see you all soon and enjoy yourself and stay safe. Bye, everybody. Hi, Hannah. How's it going? <laughs> Are you going to go to the next one? Um, no, I think I'm going to do some work now. <laughs>